insurance companies can't discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions, but it can cancel policies if people have committed uh, fraud or haven't filled out their forms correctly. And that's what the insurance companies have always done when they didn't want to cover someone. Remember in one of Obama's speeches, he talked about the woman with breast cancer uh, who was declined coverage time and time again until about a month before she died. She was declined coverage because she didn't disclose that she had treatment for acne. Well, they can do that again. They can say, sorry, you, you, didn't, close, you didn't disclose it. And so that's, that's where we are right now with health care reform. That has been a huge, huge failing. Foreign policy in general has been a huge failing. He talks a great talk. He gave a great speech in Cairo. And yet he's done nothing to bring uh, Israel to bear and to let Israel liberate the people of Palestine. And I'm sure Jennifer is going to talk about that. He talked a great deal about how he was going to make the United States just one of many nations in Latin America and that the old era of coups was over. And yet when the first coup happened under his rule, what did he do? He sat on his hands and let Zelaya be overthrown in Honduras and never insisted that he be put back into power. These are moral failings. These are political failings. The and on a crass political level, the economic failings are, are doing him in. On the ideological ground, where he you know, climbed aboard this leaky vessel of bipartisanship, he's been sunk on that ship. Uh, that was just, I don't know if he believed himself that it was possible to have bipartisanship with how hostile and reactionary the right wing is, if he was fooling himself or trying to fool us. But he's suffering as a result. These are all failures on his part to meet the exigencies of the moment, the fierce urgency of now. I do want to be fair. He hasn't <coughs> done everything badly. He's done some good things. And I'm serious. In his first week of office, let's look at the ledger. I mean, he, he passed. He signed the Lilly Ledbetter law that allows women to sue for sex discrimination after the Supreme Court, the reactionary Supreme Court, said they couldn't sue except in the first 180 days of being on the job, essentially. Uh, in the first week of office, he did lift the global gag rule on nonprofit organizations non-governmental organizations overseas that were receiving money from the United States government that they could now mention the word abortion and not lose their money. He did lift the ban on immigrants with HIV and AIDS, an immoral ban that had been in place for years and years and years. He did uh, require equal protection for transgender persons in the federal government. His Commerce Department hired the first out transgender uh, official, Amanda Simpson, to join the Commerce Department. He did, according to the Center for Science and the Public Interest, pull a 180 on preventive health and brought the U.S. government uh, into you know, the contemporary era as far as public health goes and stressed some public health issues. Speaking of 180 degrees, he you know, moved the government's policy on global warming at least into the you know, 20th century, if not the 21st. He could have done more at Copenhagen, but at least he's not in the denial camp that George W. Bush was in. Canceled the F-22, he took the missiles out of Poland, he took the radar out of the Czech Republic. Uh, he had a couple good appointments. Hilda Solis at the Labor Department, Sonia Sotomayor in the Supreme Court. His Justice Department is much better than Bush's. At least they are going actually after people who are uh, engaging in racial discrimination, not those who are engaging in so-called reverse discrimination. He told the Justice Department to stop prosecuting people who are using or supplying medical marijuana. You know, all these are good things. All these things are not nothing. But they're not what is necessary. He has failed really to, to go to the lengths that were necessary in this time. As Bob McChesney keeps reminding us, these aren't ordinary times. These are exceptional times. They're exceptionally risky times. We have a resurgent right wing in this country. Uh, we have a kind of neo-fascist bubbling up uh, and uh, we saw that with some of the Tea Partiers. Uh, some of it is based in prejudice. Some of it is based in ignorance. Some of it is based in, in confusion. And some of it is based in the fact that we haven't made the sale ourselves. I mean, when there were those health uh, meetings all over the summer, we should have been there. We should have been there demanding and shouting at our legislators, why aren't you for single payer? And on April 15th, we should have been in the public square saying, why are you giving trillions of dollars to the banks? So in part, you know, the failure is ours. And we need to get over this idea that we vest our hopes in a president. That was Howard Zinn's lesson. We can't do that. We vest our hopes in ourselves. 
We do the work ourselves. And so that's what we need to do from here on out. Next year, if we have this panel, I don't want to spend so much talking about Barack Obama. I want to spend some time talking about what we accomplished. Mm -hmm. You know, we can whine all day, we can complain all day, we can defend all day what Barack Obama has done. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we need to do things ourselves. And I want to leave you with one thing that we all can do. And this is a, a great grassroots campaign that's taking uh, off right now. It's taking off in part because of activist Lisa Graves and Ben Mansky right here in Madison. It's a campaign to overturn that outrageous Supreme Court decision on campaign finance. Uh, and the campaign is a fundamental one. The campaign is a radical one. The campaign is to amend the Constitution of the United States to demand that corporations are not persons, that corporations do not have the right to corporations. The corporations do not spend a single dime trying to influence our elections here. Otherwise, we have no chance at democracy. And this is something we can do by signing petitions in this state and in every state and get this amend the Constitution ever underway. So uh, I hope you will go to this website, if I can remember, move to amend.org. That's the website, move to amend.org. There's more than 20,000 signatures on a petition there already. Uh, Howard Zinn's on there. Uh, I want to close by just reading one of my favorite paragraphs, and there's so many, from Howard Zinn. But when we meet in gatherings like this, sometimes we get ourselves down. And it's really important to resist this, because if we complain too much, that can be paralyzing. And if we paralyze ourselves, the people who are in power love it. So here's what Howard Zinn has to say. And it goes on a bit, so bear with me. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there's so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is, is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. Howard Zinn. So let's live now as we think human beings should live. Thanks very much.